does training fasted enhance fat loss? And the logic is sound. If I don't have any fuel, then I should be burning more fat. Therefore, I should be losing more fat. It's sound. It's not true. It's a great idea. It's one of these classic things in science and exercise physiology where you're like, sounds good. Turns out it's not. It's actually a, a pretty gross misunderstanding of metabolism. So it's not to pick on that topic. I don't really care about that topic, but it is a, it's a common question. It also gives me an opportunity to just tell you more about metabolism. So here's what happens. You are breathing in O2 and breathing out CO2. However, the ratio to that is what we call the either RER, respiratory exchange ratio, or RQ, respiratory quotient. And I'm not going to differentiate those two. They're not the same thing, but we're going to skip past that for now. As you begin to increase exercise intensity, the percentage of O2 to CO2 rises in the favor of CO2. So you start breathing out way more CO2 than you are breathing in O2, right? And so if we were to look at that number, you know, what's the relationship? It goes up. So at rest, most people have a, a, of a value that we would typically call something like 0 0.6, okay? And that's, again, the relationship between O2 and CO2, maybe 0 0.7. If you were to go for a walk, that increases slightly because you're now expiring CO2 at a higher rate. And so now you've moved up to say 0.8 or something like that. One of the ways that we mark somebody of achieving an actual VO2 max on a test is if that value exceeds 1.1. Now, any of you who are paying attention are thinking, well, wait a minute, how the hell can a ratio between two things ever get past one? Well, that's because you're getting into a place where you're actually offloading more CO2 than is actually necessary. And this is what actually causes and explains a, a thing that people like to call EPOC, which is excess exercise post-oxygen consumption. This is another way to think about it. The only reason you're breathing is to bring in oxygen and offload CO2, right? If I'm no longer exercising, why am I still breathing? In other words, once you stop the demand or the need for, for energy, you should stop ventilating but you don't, right? And that's because in the case of low intensity exercise, the second you stop, you're right back down to resting ventilation. No problem, because you were able to match the need for energy with the offload of waste one-to-one -one during that exercise. When you start creeping up the intensity, you can't do that. So you have to basically start stealing a little bit of fuel here. So even though you're done exercising, you're still ventilating because you have to pay that back. And pay that back. By that, I specifically mean you have to bring in oxygen because you have a whole bunch of waste that's been accumulating in your tissue that you've got to deal with. And I, I'll walk you through what that waste is. It's a particular molecule that a lot of people have heard of but grossly misunderstand. So you've got to be able to handle that. So the reason that you sit there and go <sighs> and continue to ventilate is because you're now trying to pay back that excess post-exercise oxygen debt. That's that oxygen debt we're specifically talking about. All right. So that being said, as we start cruising up, that RQ starts going up, 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 up. And if we get to one, you're 1.0, you're, you're in a, like, you're hurting. You're in, a, you're in a pretty good spot. All right. I like it. You're hurting. You're in a pretty good spot. Yeah. There's a, a window into Dr. Andy Galpin's mind. And yeah. Now you really want to be a subject in his, uh, his laboratory studies. Sure. <laughs> Masochists swarm to Andy's lab. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So the idea that, I will lose more fat by being in an exercise situation that is burning more fat. It seems to make sense, but it's a massive failure to understand the metabolism. It's the exact same explanation to why exercising fasted doesn't matter. So the exercising fasted issue under normal circumstances is irrelevant because you have plenty of fuel in the system even when you haven't eaten breakfast that morning. Now, if you're talking like extended fasting over multiple days, this is a different scenario. If muscle glycogen, liver glycogen, and blood glucose are at sufficient levels, then you absolutely have enough energy to perform almost any type of exercise that most people are doing. You know, maybe if you're Rob and you're at mile 20 today, it's a different story, but the vast majority of us have plenty of fuel sitting around, so we're not going to burn more into fat um, just because we didn't eat breakfast that morning. So that just doesn't make energetic sense. We have a lot of backup supplies. You're never out. The trick here is this, is there's a, there's a concept here we call crossover concept. So as we are starting to move up exercise intensity, we start burning a higher percentage of our fuel from carbohydrates. 
and a lower percentage of our fuel coming from fat. I'm sleeping. That's the highest percentage of your fuel that will be coming from fat of any activity you could ever do. So if the theory that I'm going to stay at a lower intensity to burn more fat was true, the optimal fat burning strategy would then be to sleep. Like, that doesn't make sense. Of course it doesn't. So why would then going at a slightly elevated rate somehow all of a sudden magically make you lose fat? It doesn't actually make sense. When you think about it that way, you're like, oh yeah, there's no way. So it's a percentage trick. It's a difference between absolute and relative. This is what this confusion is. So yes, as you start doing lower intensity exercise, whether you're faster or not, it's, it's irrelevant. But lower intensity exercise, a greater percentage of your fuel is coming from fat. However, your total fuel expenditure is very low. So that whole total carbon balance is not really being shifted much. As you start exercising at a very high intensity, you actually start getting a higher percentage of your fuel from carbohydrate and a lower percentage from fat. In fact, at rest, about the highest you can get in most people is about 60% of your fuel from fat. As you're sleeping, you might be 70%, but you'll never be in a position ever, no matter what sort of thing you've heard on the internet, you'll never be in a situation where fat is your only fuel source. The highest I've probably ever seen is like 70%. Um, you should probably be at about that. That's a, that's a kind of a good number to, to think, um, honestly. But people will who understand a little bit about metabolism to be dangerous, but not enough. We'll, we'll throw out these terms like fat adapted. And fat adapted is a real thing, but is a massive misunderstanding oftentimes, right? It is this idea of thinking like, I can get into a spot where I'm maximizing fat burning. Maximizing fat burning and maximizing fat for exercise and maximizing fat loss over time are not the same thing at all, right? That's the confusion. So if you enhance fat oxidation in an exercise, that does not enhance fat loss per se, right? So this is a lot of the confusion that's happening, right? So as we start moving up, we can never get in a position where we're using fat only as a fuel. Again, at best, you're at 70% fat, 30% carbohydrate. For a lot of reasons, we probably just don't have time to get into today. However, the opposite is possible. When you get into true high-intensity exercise, you'll be basically 100% carbohydrate and 0% fat, right? That is, is very possible. That, in fact, is 1.0. That's what our key. 1.1 is actually because your ventilation got so high, you actually exceeded that number, even though you're at 100% carbohydrate. This is what people came up with the idea then. It's like, well, I don't want to burn carbs. I want to lose fat. So my response to that is always like, okay, great. So it makes sense. Burning fat, losing fat. Burning carbs is losing what then? Like, do you think your liver shrunk? Like, like well, wait a minute. What did you lose then? Where did it come from? It's all coming as carbon. Don't worry about where it came from for your fuel. It just has to come out as carbon. Right? There are differences in exercise efficiency for performance with our professional athletes, of course. But if the only goal here is fat loss, it doesn't matter where you get it from. The last bridge we have to connect here is like, well, wait a minute. If I only burned carbohydrate, how did I actually lose that fat? There was, the, there was that glove handle sitting on the side of me. How did that come out of me if I never burned that for my fuel? What you're failing to understand is there's a balance game that happens here. So if you were to do a bunch of high-intensity exercise training and you burned only muscle glycogen and blood glucose and maybe even you did it for so long you burned some liver glycogen, the body understands that it has expelled a lot of energy from that side of the equation. It's going to do a couple of things. Now, it's very difficult to go through this fancy situation where you convert carbohydrates into fat and back and forth. Like, that's actually, like, fairly hard. What it's easier to do with something you said earlier is actually just bias energetics to a different fuel source. So in that scenario where you're down really low in your carbohydrate, carbohydrate stores, any carbohydrates you bring in are going to go to storage. And since your net energy expenditure is something that your body regulates a lot, any fat that you then bring in is going to be utilized as a fuel source because it knows it doesn't need it anymore. That is in excess. So that's how you actually use fat as a fuel because you've burned down carbohydrate storages. As I'm hearing this, uh, a couple of things come to mind. First of all, thank you for that incredibly important description of what is otherwise a very confusing landscape for most people. 
one of the key points I took away, and I just want to say from the outset, this is not exhaustive by any stretch, is that burning fat does not equal losing fat from the body. Correct. And then burning fat has to be divided into burning of body fat stores. And we need to distinguish that from burning of dietary fat that is brought in. Correct. Oftentimes people don't disambiguate those. Correct. Right. And I'm also understanding that reducing one's body carbohydrate stores, muscle glycogen, liver glycogen, et cetera, occurs during high intensity exercise. Yep. 